When you work in a firehouse seven blocks from the two tallest buildings in New York, you get to know every step, every staircase, every story. This morning, Jim, couldn't get too close to that razor blade. I'm James Hamlin. I've been a New York City firefighter for nine years at Ladder One downtown. Last summer, the summer before 9-11, there were days we'd go to the Trade Center five times in a single shift. Uh, we're going to also send you some help. My point is, we knew those towers as well as anybody. But nobody, <laughs> nobody expected September 11th. On that day, guys from my firehouse, my best friends, were some of the first firefighters in the Tower One after the plane hit. What they did that day, what everyone there did, was remarkable. Chief! And almost as remarkable, it was captured on videotape inside the tower, beginning to end. The tape was shot by two brothers. Jules and Gideon Noday. Holy shit. They're documentary filmmakers and old friends of mine. <laughs> I don't know. They always say there is always a witness for history. I guess we were that day we were chosen to be the witness. The strange thing is, the tape, the whole story, it, it kind of happened by accident. I mean, Jules and Gideon didn't mean to make a documentary about 9-11. We wanted to make a documentary about a, a firefighter. That's how the whole thing got started. Nine, ten, one, two, three. More to the point, the plan was to follow a rookie. On the job, we call them probies. The idea of us to show how a kid, almost, uh, become a man in nine months, which is their probationary period, where they have to prove themselves. We teamed up, and by June of 2001, the three of us were out at the fire academy shooting the training. After a few weeks of learning the basics, a probie may think he knows what it takes to be a real fireman. He's in for a rude awakening. Can I have the lights, please? This is a probie. Became engulfed in fire. Another firefighter, no hood. Be prepared. Wear your gear. Go into a building. You never know what's going to happen. The fire is starting to really roll over my head now. The force of it knocked me down, knocked my helmet off, and my hands were gone. I take three steps into the apartment, and the floor gave way, and we all went. And I'm trying to get my body off the ground now because I'm laying in boiling water. My right leg was paralyzed for six months. This job is no joke. When you get out there, it's the real world. Don't be no hot dog show off jerk. Pay attention to the senior men and do what you're told. Stay low, stay low. Toward the end of the initial training, Help. we Help. began looking for one out of the 99 new probies to follow. My name is Paul Denver. 
John Carroll. Antonios Benetados. T Tony for short. I was a police officer. For a while I was a, a pizza man, actually. An Irish pizza man in the Bronx. This is my first job. It sounds kind of cheesy, but I always kind of wanted to be a hero. And this is really the only thing you could do that you can do that. Immediately we're like, okay, this is the kid. This is the kid. Let's, let's go. We got Tony assigned to my firehouse, one of the biggest in the city. It's Ladder One, plus a whole other company, Engine 7. I'm so glad I, I took this job. Can't beat it. My wife, sometimes she gets like so frustrated at me because I'm so happy to come to work, you know? And she gets up in the morning, she's like, oh, I gotta go to work again. Meanwhile, I'm up 5.30 in the morning, and I'm like, honey, I'm going to work. What, you what don't actually it? wear that That's what it says. They are the greatest, incredible guys. They love her. They're guys who fought some of the worst fires you can imagine. What's up with that shirt? What? What's the matter? Soon, they'd face the unthinkable. Question was, would Tony be ready? I'm terrified. This is what I want to do, but it's, it's scary. I just hope I can, I can do everything that I'm supposed to do, you know? Because I want to help these guys and I want to be a good fireman, but you know, I'm still worried about how I'm going to actually react when there's fire flying over my head. Here he goes. What's your first name? Tony. Tony. You know, you, you come in on uh, Thursday, right? Thursday? I wasn't sure of that. Thursday night. I am now, sir. Do you want, need to sit down? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Want you. to stop calling me, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous. All right. What am I supposed to do when I come in the morning? Anything I should know? Uh, be on time. <laughs> <laughs> I just I want to make sure I do everything I'm supposed to do. Thing is, when you're a probie, what you're supposed to do... We got to do the sheets. We change the sheets in the morning. So. ...is pretty much everything. More news and traffic coming up. It's 6.22. Start up top and watch the down. Proby rules. Proby always gets in the sink. Proby does not go in the TV room, ever. Proby makes sure there's always hot coffee in the morning. You have an iron at home? Uh, actually, I do not, sir. You don't? No. Proby in a lot of trouble? Take two. <laughs> I think I'm doing decently. You know, I'm still waiting for a fire. That's all. Just waiting for a fire, and uh, I think that'll that'll you know make a pretty big difference. Engine, ladder. Should we grab that big long thing from the back too? The thing is, guys say there's two kinds of probies. We're getting closer. Black clouds and white clouds. When a black cloud comes to the firehouse, that probie, he brings all the fires in the city with him. A white cloud, just the opposite. No fires. Don't get me wrong, there were fires. Just not when Tony was on duty. The kid was one very white cloud. So what do you say? Does it feel like fire today? Or, yeah? Okay, so we got a suspicious fire. Do we have any smoke condition at all? Negative. Uh, false alarm. What are you doing over there? So did you catch a job or not? Nah, no. I think it was just an elevator smoke. Tony was ready though, right? I was. I was ready. Tony was nervous, of course, terribly nervous. And as the days would pass, uh, Tony, waiting for his first fire, wanted to prove to the other guys, and even more to himself, that he was going to be a real 
great fireman. Uh, uh, Tony, yeah. I'll get back. Get so back. guys, we're not going to make it easy on him. No one was singling Tony out. We do it to every probie. We're going to break your chops till you laugh about it. Right. Because that's how we do it. All we'll right. tease you to death until you start laughing. Right. No okay. problem. You let it love this one. No, I... So no, let it, and you will. Yeah. But before you can love it, you've got to learn it. Now, say you got up there now, got your helmet on, your bunker gear, and you, you got to get your mask on. How are you going to do that without letting go? Uh, I don't know. When we hit, what's the best way to hit? Uh, on one knee. Hit. Next time you do this for real, you're going to be more cautious. Right. You did, you did fine. Right. All I want you to do is learn to relax. All right. You got to remain calm. Okay. So you got to control that surge. Okay. Okay. Not bad. No. Not bad. Yeah, that handwriting's getting better already. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Hey, day today, baby. Yes. Okay. Thank you. For two weeks, I got six hundred and seventy-two dollars and twenty-five cents. Oh, you gotta be kidding me! You couldn't even buy a six-pack with that. Oh, crap. It's starting pay, you know. If I wanted to get rich, I would have become a lawyer. But I wanted something that I'd be able to live with for the rest of my life. This I can live with. A lot of the guys feel that way. You need to get up in the morning and look yourself in the, in the mirror and, and say you, you, you're doing something with your life. Somebody's in there. Hit the door. You do your job, you risk your life to help people. <laughs> and with time, you become part of a unique, extended family. We do a lot of things with our families together. You know, you got a bunch of guys here that just, uh, they want to be here. making some uh, onions and mushrooms for the steaks. How you doing, Jamal, huh? You doing pretty good? Yeah? Here you go, Jamal. Ah, this is a good storm here. Oh, 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 Tell me one other job where everyone sits down to dinner together every night. Now, Steve, you, you gotta be tired now. <laughs> Let me help you, Steve, because I think I'm the only guy that helps you in this firehouse. <laughs> weeks, something like that, and I'm still, still no fire. It'll come, probably when I'm asleep and not ready for it. That's when it'll come. It's 2.30 in the morning, bro. <laughs> you, can, you can sleep, you can. All right. Trust me, when the alarm goes off, they'll come and get you. I'm <laughs> Engine, matter. Thank 
So down, spin! I got to spray water. You're getting closer. There you are, Tony. Look, your first fire. <laughs> and it was a car fire, no less. That's all right. My first fire was a garbage can fire on West Broadway in Franklin. Listen. Tony was getting closer. Did he wave you? But for the record, that was some flame. It wasn't a real fire. Hey, Chief, come see his first fire. If they're all like that, it's going to be a fun 20 years. We have this fire over here. Here's the fire, see? Stretch a line, put out the stakes. <laughs> By the end of August, we knew that we had a great cooking show. and. There were no fires. Waiting for a job, that was a very big concern. But every time we would talk with some of the senior guys, they always told us, well, be careful what you wish for. Yesterday, a 27-year-old firefighter in Staten Island, he was stationed. Went to a job and uh, he passed away. This guy left behind a two-year-old son and uh, a baby on the way. You know, this dude was just expecting to go home and see his girlfriend after the tour that day, you know? And, well, uh, we'll go to the f f funeral on uh, Saturday and you know, what can you say? I look back to last summer and it doesn't just seem like a different time. It seems like a different world. At the time, we didn't think there could be anything worse than losing a single firefighter. I mean, looking back, we were all just we were kind of innocent, especially Tony. A bunch of the guys were talking about what different parts usually get them at the funeral. When the coffin went past, that was, that was, that was a little rough. I don't know. I know I, I hope it's my last one. So go straight up right now. A lot of things going on at all times, you know? Right. Shit's hitting the fan, the roof starts to collapse, you gotta get off. You know, you gotta really improvise. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Basically, you have to be on the top of your game. Right. You're not the OV. You're on the top of your game. This right. is not a joke, this job. You know? Right. It's a lot of things to think about, you know? And tunnel vision, focus, right. really, because that's what's gonna keep you alive, and that's what's gonna give you the opportunity help anybody else. Right. Yeah. All right, you ready to go down? Fire or no fire, Tony had learned a lot that summer. Sure, he had a ways to go, but we'd teach him. Far as we knew, there was plenty of time. A few days later, Jules cooked a French dinner for the guys. At least he tried to. Decided to cook leg of lamb, which I told him for a long time was one of my specialties. I think he cooked one, and 
We really needed at least five. Where's Frenchy? A couple more meals like this, we'll be able to share shirts. All right, all right, I got a small piece, so what? I my mistake. <laughs> we stayed up late, just telling jokes and busting chops. This is it, that's all that's left. This is the best part of the meat. Even though the guys were making fun of us because we didn't cook uh, enough, we we're all having a great time. We we're getting uh, accepted. Touchdown! Oh, you were just shaking it in the head. I don't know. You we all joked all night long. It was really a great night. Little did we know. It was the night of September 10th. Sunshine throughout, low humidity, really a splendid September day. The afternoon temperature about 80 degrees, great weather for the primary election. Tonight, clear and cool, low 60 of the It's begun to sound like some sort of a cliche, but really, September 11th started out like every other day. Well, currently winds out of the northwest at six miles per hour, relative humidity 70%, 66 in Newark, 64 degrees in Bridgeport, 67 in Midtown, and heading for 80. Eight o'clock in the morning. Don't throw the fat away. The day guys were just coming in. I was off that day. Thirteen guys from my firehouse were on. Around 8.30. Matter. I believe the run came in. Get the run for the gas leak, or an odor of gas in the street, actually, I think it was. It's just lisping on in church, odor of gas. And we responded. Arrived in minutes. Yeah, I don't think anything of it. You just you get on the rig, you go, you say, all right, it's an order of gas. Jules was riding with the battalion chief, Joseph Pfeiffer, videotaping. It was just another call, and I'm riding with the battalion chief. It was basically camera practice. See, Jules had only been shooting for a few weeks. Before that, Gideon was the main cameraman. Every time the battalion goes, I go. You know, I just need to practice, so. I shoot. Uh, no, I don't stop. We checked the area with meters, and it, it was kind of routine and um, pretty simple. It was 8.46 in the morning. And then we heard a plane come over. And in Manhattan, you don't hear planes too often, especially loud ones. Right then and there, I knew that this was going to be the worst day of my life as a firefighter. Immediately, I knew that this was an, an accident. What am I doing on this? Go, go to the trade center. I know, Blake. We knew you know, this was going to be something unusual, something tough, but it would be something we could handle or at least deal with. Oh, my God. That looked like a direct attack. Chief Pfeiffer made the first official report. Italian once we had it. We have a number of floors on fire. It looked like the plane was aiming towards the building. Transmit a third along. We'll have the staging area at Vesey and West Street. Yes, sir. 
probably a, a two minute ride, but it seemed like it was forever because there was a lot of things going through your head. I felt sorry for the people, the, the people inside the building. What was going to happen, nobody had any idea. We've never experienced something like this before. Everyone we was passing was looking up. It's like the world just stopped. We are just currently getting a look at the World Trade Center. We have something that has happened here. Flame and an awful lot of smoke from one of the towers. Whatever has occurred has just occurred uh, within uh, within minutes. And uh, we are trying to determine exactly what's on. Where you are, right in there. As we swung around in front of World Trade, my mind tells me, wow, this is, this is bad. What do we do? Like, what do we do for this? We park right under the awning of One World Trade Center. Chief Feinfried puts his gear on, and I remember asking him, you know, Chief, can I come in with you? I want, I want to come in with you. And he says, yep. Yeah, you stay with me. Come in with me, never leave my sight. I go in, and I hear screams. And right to my right, there is two people on fire, burning. I just didn't want to film that. It was like, no one, no one should see this. Pfeiffer was the first chief into the building. Right away, a guy from the Port Authority told him the damage was somewhere above the 78th floor. But all you had to do was look around. It was obvious something had happened right there in the lobby. You just, you just saw that all the windows were blown out. The lobby looked like the plane hit the lobby. Later, they'd figure out that flaming jet fuel had shot straight down the elevator shaft. All of this damage was done already. People was all over the place. So you knew it was going to be worse when we got upstairs. Flames are shooting out. Smoke is pouring out. I want you to get an engine and team up. Let's get an outside line. Walk to 7. Okay, I want you to come any higher than 70. What was going on? My main concern was we had you know, 20 floors of people above. And we had to figure out a way to get them out. As it turned out, we had no usable elevators. With the elevators out, there was only one way to get up there. Walk. Companies come in. You see them with a concerned look on their face. And they're sent up. A firefighter in full gear, carrying 60-something pounds of hose and equipment, takes about a minute to climb one flight of stairs. These guys were looking at 80 stories just to get there. Then they'd start working. I felt the mood that we were going to put the fire out. Everyone seemed to be confident. I know I was. You basically looked at it and said, OK, we got 10, 20 stories of fire. <laughs> you know, we'll deal with it. We'll get up there. You know, we'll, 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 we'll get to it. There are fire crews just screaming into this area from every conceivable direction. By this time, some of the top chiefs in the department had joined Chief Pfeiffer, running the command post, sending guys upstairs. Every time I looked around, it was new faces. Some that I, uh, I, I recognized, 
But I see Chief Pronti, great guy, white hair, mustache, the perfect grandfather that you'd like to have. I remember seeing uh, Lieutenant Fody, who was uh, working with Nine Engine. Said hello and then started going up. Another of the men who went up was Lieutenant Kevin Pfeiffer. He was in charge of Engine 33, and he was the chief's brother. I just remember we both looked at each other, said a few words, and but it was more the look with it, a real concern that this was going to be something tough. It's going to be a tough job. It's going to be a long job. They'll put it out. That's what they do. The last time Jules had seen his brother was an hour ago at the firehouse. Far as Jules knew, Gideon had followed Tony, the probie, into the tower. When we had left for the odor of gas in the street, engine, for me, it was in the engine. And then when we arrived to the Trade Center, he went up immediately with the guys. So for me, my brother is going up the stairs. It turns out, Gideon was with Tony. Engine 7, ladder 1. This is Firefighter Benetata. But Tony was still at the firehouse. Yeah. No, I was off duty. And now he'd been ordered to stay there. Everybody's been recalled. All available units must come back to the firehouse. While Tony tried to keep up with the phones, this is Firefighter Benetata. Gideon took his camera and started walking down towards the Trade Center. He was sure his brother was inside, and he wanted to get to him. I remember uh, slowly walking down to the World Trade Center. What really stick in my mind is passing by the people and filming them and filming their astonishment. And the eyes saying, this is not happening. remember tilting the camera back and forth between the people and the tower in front of me. of the World Trade Center have been hit by aircraft. Both are in flames. Both uh, suffered explosions. There is uh, black smoke coming from both of the towers. Uh, it's a horrific scene here. There's um, debris flying through the air over the East River here into Brooklyn. Uh, what appears to be... Right. 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 There were two planes. I saw the second one hit. It hit the other tower. What we knew was that a second plane hit, and we had a lot of people trapped. Stay together. Stay together. You know what's going on. Now the Chiefs would have to set up a whole other operation over in Tower 2. When the second plane hit, that's when you could see fear. Both of them are on fire. You could see it in everybody's eyes. There were people from all over the world in these streets. Different colors, different languages. 
on those few blocks between the firehouse and the World Trade Center, the entire world was there. There's two aircraft. Two aircraft. Two aircraft. The first one on one World Trade Center. The second one just happened. And they were all looking at the same thing and talking about the same thing and reacting the same way. You saw a plane going into the side. Went straight into the building, right there, into the side. Yes, how big is the plane? That was a direct hit. That was a huge one. There were two planes. Yeah, there's two. One of these buildings. Yeah, I saw the last one. We are boom in the house. What are those people going to do? On the second one? Yeah. All, all the elevators are blocked out. Yeah. That, well, the staircases must still be, yeah. right? The stairs were crowded. People were coming down burnt. Upstairs in Tower One, the guys from my firehouse were now 10 floors up and climbing. If we did talk, it was to the people coming down, trying to comfort them, tell them it's all right, get out, stay calm. I wound up finding a woman in the uh, sea staircase. Her arms were all burnt. She was just sitting there, basically in shock. So I picked her up under her arms, and I put her in with a group of guys, and I asked the group of guys to, you know, take it down. I spoke with one person. I think the highest floor that I had heard was about uh, a survivor from the 80th floor coming down. So we know that that was intact. We knew it was going to be a long haul getting up there. And you had to try to conserve as much energy as possible if, if, if that was even possible, you know? I'm hot. You know, I could feel the blood in my, my neck pumping. I could feel my, my whole, you know, my whole heart. My whole system is really working. I knew we had to get up to help people. We had to get up there. I knew we'd get there, but it was just going to take a while. You're talking about thousands of casualties and thousands of potential casualties. They was pretty much saying, God bless you. Can't believe y'all going up and we're coming down. People, they pretty much said, why are y'all going up there? Get out. Their concern was to get everybody out. That was the key. As much people out as possible. Most of the people in Tower One came out on the mezzanine above the lobby. Then they'd get out through another building. All right, I want to use the lobby of seven as a triage. The chiefs didn't want anyone going through the lobby doors. First, it was because debris was falling outside. Then, it was people falling. You don't see it, but you know where it is. What's that? And you know that every time you hear that crashing sound, it's, it's a life which is extinguished. It's not something you could get used to. And the sound was so loud. I just remember looking up, thinking, how bad is it up there that the better option is to jump? Like something out of the Tower Inferno, like a movie. Wins News Time 9:12. A major disaster in New York City this morning. Breaking news now on 1010 Winds. Well, we now have some insight as to what's going on in the air here. The FBI is now investigating reports of a plane hijacking before these crashes we're telling you about at the World Trade Center towers this morning. Rescue crews are uh, making their way to the scene, and all of this unfolding in one of the busiest places in the world, in downtown Manhattan. Again, both towers uh, hit by aircraft. And again, two planes involved in two crashes into either tower of the World Trade Center at about 10 to 9 and 5 after 9 this morning. Pieces of the building and the planes actually landed blocks away. 
Gideon was walking with his camera when he found a chunk of the plane engine that had crashed completely through Tower 2. Don't be picking stuff. Don't get this as evidence. No, you don't pick it. All right, all right, all right. All right, just get out of here. Just go. This is evidence. You're kicking stuff. What's the matter with you? That was as close as Gideon would get to the Trade Center, without a firefighter anyway. So I decided that the smartest thing to do was to slowly walk back to the firehouse and find a way to go to Jules. We're just getting word now. One of the two planes was hijacked after takeoff from Boston. This is two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. We now have reports of a fire at the Pentagon. A fire at the Pentagon being reported this morning. I was just saying that the officials are calling this an act of terrorism. They're saying that's clearly what it is, clearly not an accident. Arriving back at the firehouse, and Tony is still alone, and he has no clue of what to do. The, of the, pan is, uh, the Pentagon's on fucking fire? War. This is war. And just by listening to him, freaking out and swearing and, and behaving like I've never seen him behaving, Tony was expressing what we all felt. At that point, I saw the fireman in him taking over. I can't believe the fucking Pentagon. Somebody has balls. I mean, a few times he was just pulling his gear and about to rush to the door, and realizing that he was the only one in charge of this empty firehouse. And going back to the house watch and looking again at those pictures on TV and just to make sure that it was real. Tony just wanted to go there. In the lobby, the chiefs were trying to run the largest rescue operation any of them had ever seen. With next to no information coming in from outside. You got a phone that's working? I think the entire world knew more than we did. Everybody had seen the attacks. Everybody had seen the tower burning. The New York avion s'est encastré dans une des deux. seen the Pentagon. For us, we didn't have a clue of what was going on outside our lobby. like a beehive, that place. Everybody's working on the phone, everybody's working on the radio. Everybody's getting information, sending guys up, getting reports. And just trying to get this thing under control. At one point, there was even a rumor. A third plane was heading in. You got to remember, at that moment, anything seemed possible. Other than NYPD, Port Authority, police, and the military. And I need that done now. On top of everything else, just talking to the guys in the stairwells was tough. Four David to Battalion 7. The tower's internal communication setup had been knocked out by the crash. That left fire department radio. Suddenly, you have hundreds and hundreds of firefighters that have radios. It seems to become more and more difficult. Base. 
Please provide me again with your location. Is there anyone in this call? Is there anyone in this call? We had one guy from the WTC who was trying frantically to reach anyone on the elevators. 69 car, anyone in this car? Oh, is there anyone in this car? And going through the list. Hello, is there anyone in this car? And there's about 98 elevators in the World Trade Center. 70, 70 on the in the middle of all this, suddenly, an elevator opens up. And you see people, not having a clue of what's going on. Because they've been stuck in there since the first plan hit. Are we seeing the look on the firefighters? It was not fear, it was, what's going on? Disbelief. That made me panic a little bit. That made me panic. It was the first time I had seen Father Judge, the chaplain, as he's called. He was in the lobby with us, and he, I could tell that he was praying. You know, Father Judd, he, he would at least make eye contact with you and kind of give you a reassuring look. That wasn't occurring, almost like he knew that this was not good. at the firehouse. What's up? What's up? Off-duty guys were starting to show up. You know, Paul, we're just waiting right now. What's that? We're just waiting right now. Tony was, uh, he just had one thing in his mind. This is bad. To go there. And he couldn't. Two fifth alarms right away. And you know the fucking Pentagon is burning now. What? The Pentagon is burning. I want everybody to stay here and they're gonna deploy us as needed. Right now they got enough guys down there, they want us in case anything else breaks out. And that's when Chief Burns arrived. I need a cup of coffee. Larry Burns joined the fire department in 1957, retired a battalion chief three years ago. I couldn't wait. I had to get down there. Because you know what? They're my firefighters. It's my building. It's my city. We do gear all together, get a flashlight and a bottle of water. Okay. Told the probie, get your gear, let's go. I remember Tony asking me to bring him some gloves, Gee, medical grab gloves. A box of gloves. Go grab a box of gloves. And by the time I found them and rushed back, they were gone. The probie and the retired chief were lost in the crowd. Headed down to the Trade Center. Oh, Lord. Oh. I think at that point, the lobby was pretty empty. There were just a few of us in the lobby, and uh, we were discussing tactics. This is Tower One. This is Tower One. What a big one here. Some of the outlying companies didn't know what Tower One was and Tower Two. So we were just trying to help them out by writing it on the desk to make it obvious to, to people. It was just before 10 o'clock, a little over an hour since the first plane hit. Firefighters from all over the city were inside those towers, hundreds of them.
Uh, a situation that uh, started bad just gets worse and worse and worse. The World Trade Center, South Tower, which was hit by a plane and wrecked by an explosion approximately an hour ago, has totally collapsed. What happened? If you're just joining us this morning, uh, you're in for a, a horrific surprise. The scene here is just one right out of one of the movies you would see in Hollywood. People walking around with uh, cell phones and tears, uh, holding their heads, looking up at what's left of the World Trade Center, and just shaking their heads in disbelief. Out on the street, everyone knew what just happened. The South Tower was gone. They saw it collapse and ran. I waited. Time slowed down and everything became pitch black. Everybody all right? Yeah, I'm okay. How's the way out of here? And then realized, okay, I'm, I'm not dead. Yeah, right here. So let's uh, turn on my uh, floodlight on top of my camera. All right, come on down this way. Oh. Yeah, let's get out the way we came in. Inside the Trade Center, yeah. all Jules and Chief Pfeiffer knew. Well, yeah, right here. All anyone knew was that something had gone terribly wrong. They asked me, you with the light, to help us out. So it was pointing my light wherever they needed. I remember seeing Chief Pfeiffer. Command post to all units. Evacuate the building. Command post to all units. He gave it right away, very calm, didn't wait. And it was for him, it was a precaution. It was okay, something wrong is happening. Let's get everybody out. Where's that flashlight? From the tone of his voice, I knew that it was no normal thing. I knew it was time to leave. I remember saying to the guys, well, it's, uh, we're on our own now. And for the first time, I looked in someone else's eyes and saw fear, Whew. which you don't see with the firemen. We orderly evacuated. Well, it was such a long walk, 21, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13. And I was going down the stairs. I could remember a fireman resting on the landing and uh, telling them, you know, we've heard a mayday, get out of the building. And, uh, I don't think they, a lot of them, I know for a fact, did not take it serious. You start to feel your anxiety build up. And take a deep breath, and you say, it's going to be all right. Let's, let's just keep going. I have brothers ahead of me, brothers behind me. We're in this together. We're fighting together, and, and we're going we're gonna to do what we have to do. Sarge. Sarge. Hey, Pete. Come on, Pete. I was not even consciously filming. I was just had my camera by my side and pointing the light wherever they needed. Sorry. Needed my light to uh, to to actually help someone, and then I realized it was Father Judge. Hey guys, here we need a hand. We saw him lying at the the base of the escalator where we were, and I I removed his white collar and I opened up his shirt. And I remember checking for his pulse and realizing at that time uh, um, he was gone. All right, we got four guys. Come here. Where's Chief Hayden? It's up the escalator right here. Come on. Up right here. Come on. Top of the escalator. Top of the escalator. Top of the escalator. After that, 
we had to figure out how to get out of where we were. Because if you go out this way, uh, right where we are now, people are still jumping, debris still falling, and it's too dangerous. You cannot go out this way. Chief Pfeiffer tells the people carrying Father Judge, okay, stay here. Which way? I told him that I'll be back and wait here, and I'll see if the bridge is, is still here. Chief Pfeiffer went to check one of the footbridges leading out of the Trade Center. If it was still standing, it'd be their best way out. And now I wonder for the first time if, uh, if Julie's still alive. I never thought about it uh, before. I realized that Jules could be dead at that very moment. And I was feeling so responsible. I was the one who uh, put him in this situation. I had to find Jules. Gideon hitched a ride with three off-duty firemen, determined to get to the Trade Center the only way they could, in a pickup truck. There are Maydays being given, and we start to figure out, okay, it's much be worse than we think, because you cannot have that many Maydays and all that dust and that noise. That's when I felt the danger for the first time was all around you. I mean, every single cell of your body was telling you, you know, you should not be here. The scenery was radically different. I mean, it was this white powder everywhere. Just a few people here and there. Take yourself as mask. Get masked, we get an extra cylinder, and I want to go in. And this kind of silence. You have ambulances straight down. Thank of you. course, Thank uh, you. there's no word on casualties. You have ambulances straight down. But suffice to say, the uh, loss of life, uh, presumably profound. Ambulance straight down. 
Everyone's just straight down. Two around. Of course, at this point, everyone's concern is just getting north, getting away from the World Trade Center, as well as finding out where their families are. The south tower of the World Trade Center just minutes ago collapsed to the ground. Only one tower is standing at this point. I have a direct line of sight to what is left of the World Trade Center. The fire continues to burn. I can see the flames through the thick smoke. By this time, Chief Pfeiffer had found a safe exit and tried to radio the men in the lobby. No answer. So we walked across the bridge back towards the Trade Center. I'm still trying to call on the radio and not getting through. The guys that we left there, they're not there anymore. They had already gone out another way, carrying the body of Father Michael Judge down the street to St. Peter's Church. They laid his body on the altar. The chief, his aide Eddie Fahey, and Jules walked outside, underneath the footbridge they just crossed, and into a scene that none of them could even comprehend. And there's debris everywhere, there's dust, covering the entire place. And we look, and the tower is here. So we say, okay, well, probably to something else. The tower is nice, it's standing. The other one, we can't see it, but it's probably just, you know, on the other side, and no one tells us. We have no clue. Where the trade center was, was uh, just covered with smoke. And that's not unusual for a fire to have a, a building disappear behind the smoke. And then was it just a, a sense that this wasn't a good place to stay? So we walk north. Just trying to figure out what took place here and then try to gain some control. So we started to rebuild some sort of structure. Chief Pfeiffer's priority was to set up a new command post and find his men. Right now, they were coming down the stairs. At some point, I started to run. I don't know, even know if I was touching stairs on my way down. When I got about to three or two is when I started to think of my family, you know. So I got to get out of here. When we got out to the lobby, it was unbelievable. Nobody was around the command station. There was nobody at the command station. It looked like the end of the world. I, I joked about it. I said uh, the command post was abandoned. The board was set up and nobody was there. I said, oh, this is not a good sign. <laughs> I knew there was nothing I could really do. I mean, I was not a fireman. I had absolutely no medical expertise at all. Um, I was just a civilian. But as a cameraman, 
Yeah, there was something I could do. And it was to document what was happening. So the cameraman took over and just filmed. Gideon had made his way as close to the tower as he could. Strange enough, I kept the only thing I was that was my preoccupation was to 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 clean my lens. I don't know if it was a, a way for me to try to focus on something so I can stay away from the horror of the uh, the reality, but that was just my obsession was saying my lens needs to be cleaned. Jules was with Chief Pfeiffer, who was plotting his next move. The firefighters from my house had reached the lobby and scattered. You know, kind of walking at this point. We knew we were out of the building, felt we were safe. Unfortunately, there were people jumping out of windows. You could see them hitting the ground or around you, debris hitting the ground. I thought we was going to get out the building, the chiefs will meet up, and then we come up with a plan, and then we go back in. That's what I thought it would, it would be something like. Just before I walked out, a uh, fireman out in the middle of the street was yelling at me, wait, wait, throwing up his hands. And uh, at that time I waited, and there was a big thud, and then another thud, and uh, there was two people who had uh, fallen or jumped from way high up. Get yourself accounted for with Chief Corey down at staging. Let's move. Come on, officers. Basically, everybody was standing right in the shadow of Tower One. It was 10.28 in the morning. And then comes that, that sound again. And I don't even have time to think at that point. I just run. And it's dead silence. There's nothing. No radio calls, no, no sound, nothing. And I feel the person who was on top of me get up. Get out of here. Yeah. Uh, with me? Yeah. And I recognize it's Chief Pfeiffer's voice. And I just realized it's just, you know, it jumped on top of me to protect me from all this. <laughs> Chief Pfeiffer said, okay, let's go now. And we get up. The dust starts to clear because the wind was blowing in the opposite direction. After that, it was just trying to literally walk around the block and, and regroup and walk back to the scene and, and see what we could do. Less than a block away, Gideon was still in darkness. The pounding stopped. And you realize now that you just can't breathe anymore. We need help! Yeah. Yeah. It's 
At that point, I realized that I was going to die. We're over here behind the oh. issue truck. This way. Keep oh, shouting. Come, here. Come get a truck. Come Let's on, go. we gotta get out of here. Come on. Let's go. You gotta, you gotta fucking move, man. Come this way. And the only thing I could think about it was truth. And I remember telling myself that if I would survive that, I would, uh, I would be a, a better brother. You can make it. Help him, help him. Quickly, it's right here. He weighs 400 pounds, dude. You get over here. We got Dave to leave him here. He's not standing. You need to come over here and fuck help. The last person Gideon had filmed is now lying in the middle of the street. Grab his leg. Buddy, where's he going? This guy must have been standing outside in the street when everything collapsed. And he survived it. And with the help of an FBI agent, he walked him to safety. And we can't see a thing. You have to walk, sir. You have to walk. You're almost there. Almost there. Come on. Yeah. And he would uh, pass out every second. So it was very difficult to, to carry him. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. No. Close it! Do you have some water, something to drink? Thanks. Open your mouth, open your mouth, because I need the water too. Yeah. I had been in this street three times in the last hour. The first time it was full of people. The second time, everybody was running away from it. And the third time, getting out of the last collapse, there was just nobody. And everything was white. Everything was covered by the dust. Holy shit. I cannot describe what took place. It is uh, a scene just not to be believed. The smoke's still billowing. What we do have uh, is a lockdown. You can't get in, you can't get out, you can't go up, you can't go down. I see that I'm still in the middle of the street, uh, and I see there is a little deli. It seems to be open in the corner. Yeah, we're getting all two now. Oh, okay. A lot of people injured. <laughs> Firefighters, bloody nose, things like that. <coughs> and then it hits me. But now, where is my brother? <coughs> I start realizing that I've probably lost my brother. So I try to go back to the World Trade Center. I need to go find my brother. Where are the guys? I have no idea. I was with the cheap fire firm. And I'm in the middle of the street walking and a cop approached me and says, you know, who are you with? I'm with the chief of uh, with Battalion 1. Oh, you have Italian one? Yeah. You got an ID? I don't have ID. I have my letter of, uh, oh, from take, the commissioner. It's take a, your letter and your camera you and get out of here. Change. All right? Go. So I go back up, walk north, not really knowing where I'm going. Police department? No, I'm making a documentary on, on the fire department. Come on, this ain't fucking Disneyland. Let's go. <laughs> I 
And after a while, I said, you know, there's nothing I can do here. Oh, I need to, I need to go back to the firehouse. Maybe they have some news. And maybe, maybe he's already back there. But at that point, I just, I think he's dead. And it becomes, it becomes too overwhelming. Walking back to the firehouse and not trying to think for one second about troops. That was too much. wasn't supposed to come down. guys are crying, I'm crying. We still we don't know how many guys are missing. Down here look. I got thrown into two ambulances. We both ran. I never got so many hugs in my life. They were glad to be alive, Hugs. It was a great thing to, to know that, uh, that uh, people were surviving this. I thought you guys were dead. Not the only one. I thought I was dead. We lost so much that, in that two hour period. How you doing, all right? We felt like we got the hell kicked out of us. Shot. I don't know what to do, man. Go back down there or what? Fucking shot. Man. Is everyone okay? Are you guys were in the building? Yeah. So many thoughts and emotions. And we got to call our loved ones, tell them we were okay. We made it out. We just made it out. I'm never so happy to hear my mother's voice. <laughs> Little to little, the guys started to come back, one by one. Again, the cameraman would just film. And it was just like, you heard the ground rumble, and it was just fucking debris was just chasing you, running, pulling ass. So it was just filming them coming back and asking them if they had seen Jews. And nobody could answer this question. It was extremely uh, frustrating and annoying. One guy from the firehouse came to me, and I asked him, you know, have, have you seen Jules? Do you know where he is? And he looked at me and he said, yes, he's behind you. I turned over, and Jules was there, in the firehouse. I didn't even see him coming in. And it was like meeting for the first time.
Ah, Jules, il fait right. Il me dit oui. Il me dit qu'il était tout le temps dans le lobby. Il me dit oui. Je n'ai jamais pensé que j'étais tellement heureux de rencontrer mon frère, c'est sûr. Je crie comme des bébés pour un bap de 10 minutes. Je te dis, je sais maintenant que tu vas mourir. Je pense que c'est I, I can't believe we all made it out. How did we make it out of that building? 30 seconds, another two flights higher. Why am I alive? So many others are dead. We got down to the lobby and we saw they abandoned the command post. We knew we were in trouble. We came down. It was it was it was much worse than it was when we went up. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We went up and they had everything set up and came down. It was desolate. It was like holy shit. When I'm on. We came down to the lobby. It was like the first thing was there was nobody there. Fuck. What did we do? We made it outside. We made it about a block. We made it at least two blocks, two blocks. and we started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Det yeah, detonated. They were planning yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching ran. it and running. Ran. Just ran up West Street. And then you just saw the, this cloud of shit chasing you down. You could just not ran run up it. West Street. Could I could not run it. So what'd you do? I jumped behind I a battalion just... car. I hit under the car. I was waiting to die. <laughs> The scene here is reminiscent of a, a nuclear winter. They, they right now, everyone is walking around with masks covering their face. There's people just wandering the streets, covered in blood, covered in plaster. They were near the site when the buildings collapsed. We're on about the 20th floor. I hear this fucking rumbling. And I guess that's when two came down. I guess it hit one, crushed out the Marriott, whatever. We're at, we're we fucking dead. I guess the best way to sum this up is the World Trade Center is no more. The loss of life one can only imagine is just enormous. It, it, it must be incomprehensible at this point. They have a fireman's, they have a fireman's body in tent and house on the floor. They dragged him in, but they can't identify him. But the shirt where his name is is ripped and it's only half a body. The building started shaking. The guy started running. And then uh, by the time I got to the bottom, his body sitting on the ground. Chaplain, we carried out the chaplain. He was dead. He was dead? It exploded and it all just blew us away. The fight upon the chaplain? Yeah. Old guy. He had no pulse or nothing. We lost, we, the way we left out, we were in one. Two fell first, and then they told us to get out. Two fell first? Two fell first. Yeah, I can't figure this out. When, when you guys, when you guys when came, it fell while we were in the building. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why. When you guys came out of the building, two was already gone. Yeah. Really? Two was gone when we came out of one. on the news. Two fell. One didn't fall first. That's why they were getting this out. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I'm going to want a list of the New York City firefighters and officers that are, that are willing to go back to work again. Okay, we probably won't be leaving for at least a half hour, but I want to get a list. And then yeah, I don't know why myself and the other guys were, were picked to survive this. You're going to need masks down there. In a way, I feel that there must be a reason. And then we'll leave as soon as we get the order from uh, division. What, what am I supposed to do to, to earn this? It's not easy being a survivor.
Put your head back now, gently. Okay? Yeah. Oh, that day. That day changed everything. I think I got fibers in there. You got fibers in there. When I came back that day to the firehouse, one firefighter came to me and he said, you know, yesterday you had one brother. Today you have 50. <laughs> it's hard to even describe the emotions in the firehouse that day. On one hand, you celebrate. Very frightful day, man. Very happy to be here. Somehow the guys from our house, they got out. Everybody come back one by one at the firehouse, except one. Did you see Tony over there, Benetaros? Tony. Benetaros is the only one that... Uh... He will wear all I counted for, except for Tony. Everybody was wondering about Tony. At the same time, we knew hundreds of firefighters, thousands of people had to have died in those towers. <coughs> and every hour that passed, we were more certain Tony Benetados was one of them. Hey, guys, uh, Deputy Chief Hill called. First Division, he doesn't want anybody else down here right now. They got a million guys that are standing around doing nothing. So it's a direct order from Hill. I'd come in from home, and yeah, we were ordered to stay at the firehouse. But the truth is, the guys had to go back. Had to start digging for survivors. The fucking mentality, get in there, get in there, get in there, get the people out. It's bred in you, it's programmed into you. I had to go back. And find the kid. Gone, man. I got down there just as Seven World Trade finally collapsed. No sign of Tony anywhere. It had to be almost six o'clock, nine hours after everything started, that Tony just walked in. I walked in like a daze. And they were all like, hey, it's Benetados, you're all right. What's wrong with your hand, anything? No. No? Yeah. You all right? Yeah. Just chill out. How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh. What happened on your end? Uh, I was in the building. Were you? Yeah. Is everyone from the house? Everybody. Everyone? Everybody in the Green, How you doing, Tony? <coughs> <coughs> nice five to see there for you. All right. So everyone's accounted for? I do want here. Yeah. Everyone who is out of, out of the box? You were the last one. You motherfuckers, man. I was so sure you did it with that. I'm fucking digging through shit. And you fuckers are chilling here eating oranges? And I'm roaming around looking for you. The last one that went out there came back, and we were all OK. I left here uh, right after the first collapse. Turns out, Tony had been with Larry Burns the whole time, the probie and the retired chief. They were right there when Tower One came down. Go into the various surrounding buildings. Hello! Can we find the street? Hello! Come to the light! <laughs> Trying to calm people down. Stay where you are. Stay here until you hear different. Directing people to go to the Brooklyn Bridge to get off the island. Everybody, please evacuate the area immediately. There's people 
crying. <laughs> People injured. The one that sticks out in my mind is there's a guy, his arm had gotten looked like severed here, and he was holding his right arm and his left as he was running. And he was screaming as I was like, I need a medic, I got a bad bleed. You know, and that, that kind of shocked me. We kept going. I checked all the rigs. There were rigs crushed, paramedic trucks covered with rubble, flipped. Fires burning everywhere, huge fires. That whole day, I just searched through rubble, lifting things up, checking underneath. It was hard for him. It was very hard for him. He's only been a firefighter for, you know, a couple of months. But he proved himself that day to all the guys, yeah. There was so much that we didn't know about that first day. Who had attacked us, how, why. All we knew is that nothing would ever be the same. I must have saw about seven or eight bodies flying through the air, coming from set 80 floors up. And then, of course, the, the images of the replay that never stops of the planes hitting, the towers coming down. And it was like, OK, enough TV. Thankfully, the, uh, the power went out about that time, so it was, it was a relief. Yard. And uh, then we'll hook the lights into it. I got two more sets of lights coming. The entire downtown Manhattan lose power. It was really this feeling that we're going to be there for a long time. At the firehouse that night, we just tried to take it all in. It's weird, like, look at the date. 911. That's the date. But that's just it, the whole yeah. thing. They know we're all ready for New yeah. Year's Eve. They we're all ready no. for this, we're all ready for that. We're not ready for September 11th. What's, has anybody seen the news? What else happened? Oh, yeah. well, you know what? I'm afraid to watch the news. But both towers are completely leveled. Both towers? Both. Three buildings are flooded. I think they disconnected. Four, five, six, six seven. seven. It's gone. It's gone. They're all gone. The roof of the Marriott, we were on the roof of the Marriott. There was parts all over the fucking place. Legs, feet. It was nasty. You all right, brother? Yeah, I'm all right. One of the things that sticks with me more than everything I saw is I sat down to next to Ted. He looked real bad. I said, Tony, man, it, it, was, it was raining bodies. And just the way he said it, man, it just the man had been through hell. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. It's a very depressed, dismal, miserable mood. Hundreds of firemen, thousands of civilians are gone. As much, as quickly as you blow out a match, you're gone. Flip a switch, you're gone. That's it, just blow this game down. Go. You see them. It's hard to believe they're not there. They're not there. This was my first reaction. They're gone. There is no more World Trade Center. No. It did happen, right? 
It's not something that I'm going to close my eyes and, and open them again and, and I'm going to see the tower, right? It's not there. You know, and, and the only thing you have, really, and, you know, and the only thing that really kept it all together was us as a group, as a body, as a firehouse. Around midnight, we sent Tony up to lower the flag to half-mast again. There's going to be a lot of pain to deal with in the future. I have a pretty good friend. Well, it was in my uh, academy class in my squad. It was among the missing. A lot of guys, we all lost friends and family. I don't want to ever have to put that thing at half mast again for the rest of my career. That's it. Until the recall ends, it's 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, 24 off. We got word that we'd start digging in the morning. Some of the guys with wives and kids went home just for a few hours. They knew it might be days before they'd see their families again. My son was sleeping. I picked him up and I put him in my bed and I wanted, I wanted him to be with me. And normally I would take him out of my bed and put him in his own bed, but this night was the opposite. He didn't mind that. He, he actually had a big smile on his face and it was wonderful to see that smile again. Uh, probably the best, best entrance I ever made to a place. And the kids came out and we just kind of all cried in one big hug. And uh, it was, uh, we, we, just, we just cried. because I wanted to get down and I figured, well, we're gonna have plenty of people to, that are gonna be trapped, for sure. We're gonna get them out. We have to, we always do. I don't know if anyone's really pulled themselves together. Focus on what you're doing today. Time enough in a couple of weeks to, to really take in what happened to our, to our guys. But today, you must focus on what you're doing. Go in teams of two. One guy falls through a hole, you're going to have a guy there that knows you fell in that hole. Take a ride. We're all alive. That's, that's more than, than we could have possibly hoped for. So our job now is to go and do whatever needs to be done. And do it as much and as hard as we can for as long as they'll let us. Some of the guys took a city bus down to what the media was already calling Ground Zero. You guys got extra uh, surgical gloves. You guys didn't put them in your pockets. Some firemen called it the pile. For us, it was still the Trade Center, even if it was gone. Hey, guys, if you hear three horns, that means something might be coming down. So keep your eyes open when you're walking around down there.
I just realized something that I always wanted to deny is how evil evil can be. I need five firefighters, 19 and 12. We went down there and formed up companies, five men and, a, and an officer. We went to work right away trying to look for survivors. Try to get some buckets back here. Buckets! Guys were digging fast, passing those buckets quick. Digging frantically. Bucket! Bucket! Hey, watch your back, guys. We'd be digging, and, and all of a sudden, everybody would say, quiet. And the whole place would get quiet, and people would look. And then slowly they would go back to work and, and start again. And that was, that's how things went down there. I remember the first time I went there, it was like, you know, gateway to hell. You'd never know unless you were there. But the pile itself seemed to have a life of its own. It moved and shifted underneath us. Every step you took, you could fall 30 or 40 feet into a void. It spewed fire when we dug into it and had buried thousands of people beyond our reach. All we saw was steel, and I didn't know how we were going to get below that. Like, how are we going to find anybody in this? You know, when you, and you get up on this pile and, you, and you're digging with a shovel or you're digging with a pickaxe or something like that. It's your attempts seem futile. And, um, you know, it's like a drop in a bucket. But you believed in your heart there was somebody down there. And if you could have found one person, you know, that, that was well worth it. whatever risk you were putting yourself at, just to find anybody. That's what drives the guy. We'd clear what we could by hand. And the iron workers would come in, cut the steel beams, and lift them out. Then we'd just start digging again. You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. How are we supposed to find anybody in this that there's nothing left of the building? find a little spot and you just keep going and digging and digging and trying to find something. And you find a foot and then they say the building's going to collapse and you run away. Go, go, go! Stop, stop. Okay, okay. 
And then we would go back and mostly just dug. We found, we found a body. It was a girl. She was dead. She was, she was definitely dead. All her clothes had been burned off her. She looked to be pregnant. Some people thought maybe she was just bloated, but I don't think so. She was, she was encased in rubble. And we had her about halfway uncovered. We had getting the body bag ready, and then they told us to run. And we ran. So I never got to see if they got her out. Or would have felt good getting, saying, all right, at least I got one person out. One family will be able to have a decent funeral. Our first shift was 24 hours. And in all that time, there was one person pulled out alive. One. It was beyond discouraging. It was even hard to understand. It was weird in a way, walking back to the firehouse. People were cheering us. But we sure didn't feel like heroes. Every day, total strangers were showing up with supplies. Somebody said that if you could still use towels, so that's the end of the towels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. They opened up the doors, and lo and behold, uh, Deliveries were coming by the ton. Kitchen. Or just go right around the corner, just dump them on the floor. You can't eat all the cookies they're giving you. <laughs> no. Okay. I, I know it's early in the operation here, but I just wanted to thank everyone for all the hard work that they've been doing. How we're here, only God knows. But again, guys, thank you so much. I really you have no idea. How much love. Check the lockers, bro. Check the lockers, all the lockers, take whatever. It's something special, you know, when guys are relentless. And just calling back and forth, guys with nails in their, in their hand, taping it up, gashes, blood everywhere, just taping it up and saying, let's go back, let's see what we can do to make this situation a little better. There's gotta be people down there still alive. There has to be. Listen, we try to keep hope. And we look everywhere. We even crawl down into the stores and the subway tunnels underneath the site. But as days turned into weeks, you began to accept. There just wasn't anybody to find. But we never stopped looking. Hey, Chief. Yes, sir. We had another body over here. Firemen deal with ugly things every day. It's part of the job. But this was worse. Body day after day, it pushed guys to their limit, maybe past it. A lot of guys don't know if they're going to do the job anymore. I know it's either this or the Army now.
And I like saving lives. I don't like taking them. But after what I saw, if, they, if my country decides to send me to go kill, I'll do it now. Every night around dinner time, the fire department would put out a list of firefighters confirmed dead. And every night, that list got longer. It is with regret that the department announces the death of the following members. Battalion Chief John P. Williamson. Firefighter William Henry. Firefighter Eric T. Allen. We've lost so many people that everybody has lost dear friends, and not just one or two, but, but dozens. Most days, there was a memorial service for some guy you knew. Some days, two or three. Some days, four. One of those services was for Kevin Pfeiffer, the chief's brother. He was last seen in the stairs of Tower One, directing guys to the fastest way out of the building. I, I would say that Chief Pfeiffer's brother saved my life. Saved a lot of lives. And I remember uh, walking down West Street and just remembering saying, uh, you know, how much my brother and I used to love being downtown and, uh, and doing this job. And, um, and, um, and how now I didn't love it anymore. Some of the guys hiked up the stairs in a building near the site, but not to put out a fire or rescue civilians. One, two, three. They made the climb to lift our spirits. like our moment in time, our disaster to handle. Every generation's gone through it. Some struggle more than others. We just have to try to take it for what it's worth and, and go on. As you see little by little, life starting to go on. A few weeks passed, and we got new rigs. Well, used rigs, to replace engine seven and ladder one. They're still buried in there somewhere, under the pile. Eventually, we started going on runs again. Feels good, though. Playing pranks again and trying our best 
to love the job again. But things will never be the way they were. Every now and then still wonder, is it, is it really true, you know? I know it happened, but I don't know, how, how, how do you deal with something like this? It's the 11th every day for me when I wake up. So did you want the new tape? As for Jules and Gideon, it's strange how things work out. In the beginning, they came to me and they said, let's make a documentary about a boy becoming a man during his nine month probationary period. Turns out Tony became a man in about nine hours trying to help out on 9-11. You know how you can tell that? He's not bragging about it. They said to Phil. We were the only ones on the ticket, but it's said to Phil 1075. Do I feel like it's given me more of a sense of self-worth? Yes. Has it made me a man? No. What's a man? You know, I'll still watch cartoons and do my stupid things. I'm just a person who tries to do good, just like every other person in the fire department. For the fire department, now it's about rebuilding, somehow. At our firehouse, we've already got new probies to break in. You get one chance to make a first impression. Two guys fresh out of the academy. It's strange to think They'll never know what it was like to be a New York City fireman before September 11th. And they'll never really understand what we lost that day. All we can do is tell them the stories and show them the tape. Glen to Glen, 
and down the mountainside. The summer's gone, and all the flowers are dying. Tis you, tis you, must go and I must buy. But come your back when summer's in the meadow, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow. Tis I be here in sunshine or in shadow. Oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. And when you come, and all the flowers are dying, and I am dead, as dead I well may be. You'll come and find the place where I am lying, and me. And say, and are there for me? And I will hear the soft you thread above me, and on my grave will warmer, sweeter be. For you will bend and tell me that you love me. And I shall sleep in peace until...